Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WIPB-TV and Indiana Public Radio at Ball State University. Today we are chatting with Steve Hayes, Jr., Executive Director of Hayes Arboretum. Steve has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. And thank you, Steve, for joining us today. Thank you, thanks for having me. So the Arboretum is a wonder, wonderful place and it's been in your family for so many years. Talk about the founding of the Arboretum and the, uh, the ideas that led to its creation. My great-grandfather, Stanley, uh, came from Geneva, New York, and he settled in Richmond because of the railroad industry. And he came to Richmond 1911, started acquiring the land that is now known as the Arboretum in 1915. And it was his hobby and passion to plant native trees. So what we know as the Arboretum today was once his private estate. And for the majority of his lifetime, the Arboretum was not open to the public. It was his estate. And that was really the first 50 something years of our existence. And in 1959, we became a foundation. In 1963, we opened to the public with our first summer classes. And then um, we've been open to the public ever since. What I think is so interesting is out of your, your grandfather's sensibility to create native species, that was a rather unusual act in those days. We didn't talk about invasive species. We didn't talk about the need to preserve you know, native Indiana trees. Right. Um, and, and yet your grandfather, just out of a hobby, out of a, out of a love of, of, of natural environments, he starts to do this. And he, he pursues this activity throughout his life. Correct, yeah. Now, it was my great-grandfather, it, it was his estate, his passion, and then the vision was truly realized of what it is today with my grandfather, so his son, Bryce. And I'm, I'm happy to be part of the legacy. I'm fourth generation. And um, that's exactly it. It's, it's the appreciation of native plant material. So some of the things that we're doing today is actually to work to create more awareness and, and remedy some of the things that were counterproductive for the health of the forest that might have been promoted by ourselves. Um, by the railroads, by the construction industry, by the steel industry, which used so much timber to create coal, that, to, to create steel. And it, it is our habits and, and our drive for uh, shortcuts through production that can, can create these, the, these realities that we can then, we actually have the, have the, have the power to address those. Right, right, and, and it's about educating um, the community, educating people, creating awareness uh, about what should be planted in the environment. Sometimes what was plant material that was promoted just a short time ago, or still even today, is actually not what's native, and, and when it's not native, and it is um, maybe exotic vegetation, it can be, um, Sometimes an invasive is exotic, which invasive means aggressive, adaptive, and highly reproductive. And then what happens is it crowds out the next generation of plant material. So it, our natives can't compete for one reason or another. You know, plants are very simple. They just need sunlight, water, nutrients. And uh, if you crowd out one of those to, to any extreme degree, uh, the, the plant life suffers and the ecosystem suffers. Well, and, and your point about ecosystem is so important because each plant and the web of plants that fit together, uh, they have a complementary uh, communal aspect in which plants help other plants uh, to, to exist. And then different uh, plant ecosystems create different animal ecosystems. And then of course we fit into there because that whole a food chain connects to our food chain. So understanding the unintended consequence of planting a beautiful but perhaps invasive uh, species that is non-native and how that will change the land, uh, erosion patterns, uh, all sorts of different aspects that we are unconscious of until 30 years down the road or 50 years or 100 years down the road is so important. Give us a picture, a word picture of, of, the, of the Hazel Arboretum. So if you were a visitor to the Arboretum today, you'd come out, you see a lot of great green plant material, and 
you may not realize that the history of the majority of it is relatively short. Um, so when we talk about plants, we're talking about, especially trees, we're talking about an organism that typically outlives us, right? So we plant it for ourselves, but mainly it's for the next generation. For our, let's say you plant a tree for your children and your children's children. The trees on the majority of the Arboretum, the Arboretum was reforested uh, back in the early 1900s. Once again, my great grandfather's pa passion and part of this passion, he traveled to other arboretum throughout the country, other estates, um, west coast to east coast, and uh, he brought back his knowledge. And his landscape plans uh, from 1918 to 1922 are all recorded. We know what was planted where. He had his own nursery on property. Uh, now we get our, our tree stock from the state nursery. Uh, but he was acutely aware of what he wanted planted where it was natives. And it wasn't planted as a crop. Uh, it wasn't planted for timber value. It wasn't planted in straight rows to be harvested. It was planted in a, in a true concerted effort to be reforested and planted in a natural way. So irregular spacings, um, a mixed variety. Um, so when you come out to the Arboretum today, you can really appreciate what was maybe the woods as the settlers came to it in the 1700s. Well, and attention to, to the mix of species and attention to um, uh, uh, room to grow, uh, room to thrive, and attention to the fact that what was planted today would it would evolve over time and and allow that to evolve in a way that that the end game actually looked like the land that that existed before humans began to reshape it and that's exactly it i mean we're the only species that adapts the environment to the agree, agree that to the degree that we do to suit our needs right um, we can transform our environment in, in many ways that are truly impactful. Uh, so to see the woods as they once were uh, back when, you know, in the early uh, 1800s, late 1700s, uh, there were 24 million acres worth of woods. 24 um, million acres worth of, worth of untouched forests. Correct, yeah, through agricultural pa uh, practices and development, um, there were at the, the low point of things in the late 1800s, um, 1.2 million acres, and, and now we're at 2.4 million acres. So people may not realize it, but, but we actually have twice as many woods now um, as we did at the, at the lowest point. So Indiana, the state of Indiana, um, at one point had 24 million acres. We go down to just 5%, the last 5%. And now we've made out of that 5%, 10% Correct. Of, of what we once had. Correct. Um, and, and these are, are healthier uh, forests now also for scale because scale actually is an indicator also of health or, or a precursor to health. Land gets more fragmented over time. Mm -hmm. A farm may subdivide or a forest may subdivide. Uh, a wooded lot on somebody's lawn might subdivide over time through generations in a family. Uh, a family has children, they have children, and it further divides. So uh, the woods um, are important to, to recognize, to see the value in, and things like classified forest that the Department of Natural Resources promotes um, are, are truly instrumental in educating people of the, the value and the stewardship of, of wooded areas and forests. So how many people visit the Arboretum every year? I'd say 10,000. Since 2012, we opened part of the property for mountain biking and a day-use trailhead. The trails are now accessible, 16 miles of trails are now accessible from dawn to dusk, seven days a week, year round. That accessibility is really what helps strengthen the bond with the community, the people we serve, and helps fulfill the mission of connecting to nature. But it does make it harder to quantify 
how many yeah. specific users we have. Now, the Arboretum functions as an educational project of the uh, Hayes Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. Talk about your educational work that you do and the various programs that you have that attach to the Arboretum. So since 1963, we started offering summer classes. Uh, actually, the first two years of summer classes were in the estate house of my great-grandfather uh, because the dairy barn had not been transformed into the nature center. So, so now we have this nature center with chestnut beams uh, from 1833 that, <laughs> that is, um, you know, it's the, um, it's the primary destination for a visitor coming in to the first time for the Arboretum. Mm -hmm. And in there, they'll see exhibits about the local flora and fauna to the Whitewater River Valley. And the education is there. Um, in terms of a, our naturalist and a focus for education, it starts with the littlest ones. So we have a um, babes in the woods for the three to five year olds. And then we have classes on up from there, there's nine schools in a 25 mile radius that we truly focus on. Um, we like starting with the youngest segment of our community and hope that they can be great stewards for our environment, for their lifetime, and then their children and their children's children. Well, Steve Hayes, thank you so much for sharing the experience, the work, the education, uh, and, and the ideas of the Hayes Arboretum that has been developed over these 100 years by your family. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, it's an honor. Thank you.